Well, I'm doing Article 44 of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society's Study Edition for November 2019. Um, we, we're working on the first scripture they mention relative to build strong friendships before end times, which was uh, in the book of Proverbs, where Solomon said, A true friend show love, shows love at all times. Well, there's not many of those, is there? Um, we're trying to get past this scripture. I've put a couple of presentations out just on this little verse here relative to what can happen in organized religion. And it's like being on a train. While ever you're on that train and fitting in with everything and, you know, all the rest of it, you're fine. But as soon as you get off that train, it's going on without you. That's what shunning is. The sad part about it is, and it's complex, and I'm not going to add to, to people's experiences, but from the way I see it and the way I've, I've, I've experienced it, I always come back to saying that it's when you try and live out this idea that you've got to put the Lord your God before human beings. Now, we're not going to get on with all human beings. I was down the front a couple of months ago on crutches and the guy next door wanted to fight me. I don't know why. Luckily, the other man across the road was watching and he's a drug addict. He gets all stirred up. He's jealous. He thinks I live in the Playboy Mansion. Gosh, I'll take it as a compliment, but it's not nowhere near the truth. Um, but you see what drugs and alcohol do to people. They really mess people up. Getting back to the point here, um, a brother loves at all times. In the church I was in, um, the Pentecostal Charismatic Church, you were okay as long as you were going with the flow. As soon as you didn't want to go with the flow, you would you were out. You were on the out. You were, you were, you were shunned. As much as they would, when you'd go back, they'd accept you. The train has to go on without you. These these are organisations that ain't bending for no one, and the caliber and the um, corporateness of the Bible Watchtower and Track Society um, is huge. Just let me say while I'm here, if you, and I'm say this very sensitive, with much sensitivity and compassion, if you've been sexually abused or raped or anything like that in a religious organization, focusing at the moment on the uh, Jehovah Witnesses, please call the police or somebody else you can trust um, I've got a support line here for Australian people. I'm sorry if you're in another country. That's why I say if you can trust and have the courage to call the police, please do. Um, don't suffer any longer. And my daughter's a policewoman and I know how hard they try and uh, resolve people that have been affected by sexual abuse. They take it very, very seriously. But away from that now, back to the subject on this theological audit. A true friend shows love at all times. The man that was my pastor, um, he's dead now. He, in, in so many different ways, he protected a lot of us from going into the ministry and all the diabolical things that can happen to these poor old ministers that think they can deal with humanity. And but I do have to say, for all the abuse and everything he copped, and it was horrible, he was a true friend, the old pastor, because he not only did he allow us to come back, but he kept coming back. He buried my mother, um, and I think he buried my grandfather as well. He was a good man, and he he died also. I I I couldn't go to his I, no. I couldn't go to his funeral. It was it was too much. But a true friend shows love at all times. Now, what we've got to remember also is that Jesus said, and this reminds me of the the organisation has talks about how people should um, put the sword between their mother. If you love me before your mother and your father and all this. Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament. He hadn't died on the cross yet. 
When Jesus said that, ladies and gentlemen, he hadn't died on the cross. He wasn't, the new covenant wasn't cut. He was speaking to people under the old covenant. Oh, but us again, us Westerners, we have to take everything literally. No, 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 no. When Jesus at one stage sent them out with no money, no backpack, no this, no that, later he said, now take your money, now take your backpack and go and do this and that. When Jesus died on the cross, all this rubbish about leave your, you know, your mother and your father and put me first changed. There is nowhere in the New Testament, and I dare you to comment if you can find it, where after Jesus died on the cross, there was anything else that we needed to do except be humane, which was to love your neighbour as yourself. Put into the simplest way I can put it, is being humane. And um, that's simple to a point, till things get complicated. But being your mate is what Jesus wanted. Now, which I, I run three computers. If you're wondering why I'm getting so many videos up, I run three computers at once when I'm running hot. So a true friend loves at all times. Now, the Bible has a way of misguiding people. People want to try and fit it all in to one idealism. But you can't. You'd end up a psychotic. You'd end up a psycho. You just can't do it. At the end of the day, all the Bible wants you to do is to be humane. All your issues between yourself and God were settled when Jesus died on the cross. Now, in looking at some of the shunning talks, the Jehovah Witnesses said that you had to put the sword between your mother and your, your father and your sisters and your brothers and you had to put Jehovah first. But they don't stop and tell you that, have you heard that it was said? Where was it said? And here's some references, Ex Exodus uh, 23, 4 through 5, in Job, in Psalm etc. Have you heard that it was said, you must love your neighbour and hate your enemy? Right? Now this is a play on the Old Testament. But Jesus says, however, I say to you. Now, this is wonderful for the J-Jobs that just want to take this literally. Hate your enemy. Oh, well, Armageddon will fix all that, won't it? But Jesus says, however, I say to you, continue to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. Now, there can be a sarcastic way of doing this, a very sarcastic way of doing this. And one of the ways they can do this is by shunning. And they push the person to the side and they say that they love them and all this sort of stuff. But unless you conform to what our organisation tells you to conform to, then you'll be left as an outsider. What I want to say to you today is that your faith in your God, right? Be it the, the made-up name of Jehovah, you know who God is, right? You know who he is and you know he's not going to do any harm. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love's the fulfilment of the law. Now, it's easy for me to sit here and say this, but just thinking, when I was down at talking to the two women at the Jehovah Witness cart the other day, they were saying that they can't wait for Armageddon. And I had it recorded, but the wind wrecked the recording. And, and they're saying, oh, we can't wait for Armageddon because everybody that's trodden on Jehovah's name will be dealt with. And I said, What's so, surely you want to, you want that to be postponed. Oh no, we want Armageddon to come as quickly as it can and then everything will be fixed. And I said, so you don't care about what's going to happen at Armageddon. Oh no, we'll be protected and all these people that have trodden on Jehovah will be out of our way and everything will be okay then and everything will be solved. 
horrible language, real vicious, Muslims, Muslims type fanatic language, like someone that had run into a, a building with a grenade and just blow the, the crowd up. That's more, it's a passive form of that. This talk that the Jehovah's use of Armageddon, how they're going to be protected and everybody else is going to be wiped out, that's a passive form of a Muslim strapped up with bombs running into a building and making it explode. It is, because they're hoping that people that don't suit their organization's ways will be destroyed. And that's not Christian. How is that? Loving your enemies. Ladies and gentlemen, that's hating your enemy. That's hating humanity. We've got no right to hate you. Oh God, there's some terrible things that happen to us as humans, by humans. Horrible things. But if you want to be in this religious realm, right? You want to play religion? Then you've got to work out a way of loving your enemies. Now, what happens with shunning, and it's very, very cruel, is if you don't want to conform to the organization's way of doing things, then you will pay the penalty. And again, it's all built on trying to put your God before humanity instead of putting humanity before God. Oh God, this guy's got it all messed up. Okay, have I got it all messed up? I'm not going to go and try and prove it to you. You prove to me in the New Testament. I'm challenging you, yeah, you watching this. You find me a passage after Jesus died on the cross where the New Testament commands people to put the Lord their God before humanity because the, the, the New Testament is covered by the command which was given by God himself manifest in the flesh when he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love your neighbour as yourself. And you know what the problem we've got with that is? We have difficulty accepting and loving ourselves. I think all um, stuff to do with religion should start and finish with ourselves. Not with the person standing next to us, and all this sort of stuff. So when you hear this language, oh, Jesus said, hate your, your mother and your brother and your sisters and put no one before him. He knew when he said that, that it was impossible to do that in a humane way. There's no way you can do that in, in a way that's loving. He wasn't telling people to shun. No, 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 no. No. Let's take the lady at the adulter the adulterous lady. The woman in adultery. Let's take her for a minute. She had every right to be stoned if she had really done what they said she had done. Now I don't know if it's still on the internet, but I'm going to see if there's the footage of that poor woman that the, they stoned to death in the Middle East. Now, I do want to warn you, this footage is graphic. If it's the one I think it is, I'm just going to try and play it. It's a woman stoned for adultery. It must be the one because there's quite a few views of it. I don't find any joy in this, but I want to get the point across of the passive side the passive side where people want to do this but it's not humane it's not right to do it. but in their mind spiritually where jesus said don't commit adultery and all this in your mind i believe that a lot of the jehovah witnesses in their minds think like what's going to happen here
horrible. So we're looking at a situation in the Bible where Jesus really against all odds, against the Jewish, the Jews, was expected to give the command for this person to be stoned to death. There's a stone there. It all goes with these images, doesn't it? Now, it's no different in the mentality of the Jehovah Witnesses, in their Armageddon philosophy, only it's a passive form. Now, Jesus told the woman, as many of you would know, to go and sin no more, didn't he? He said, go and sin no more. But what he meant by that was, go and, you know, try and dodge being a prostitute. It's no good for you. Nobody can go and sin no more. That's why we need the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody can go and sin no more because the sin's in our blood. The problem's in our blood. It's not what we do. That's the fruit of what we have inside us. But Jesus said, I can't kill you, more or less, for a problem you didn't ask for, for the problem inside you that's causing you to be doing what you're doing. Now, the problem she had as an adulterer was no different to the problem that the Pharisees had as Pharisees, which was to go around killing people that didn't live up to their organisational expectations, which is exactly what the Jehovah Witnesses do to people that don't want to conform to their organisational policies, but in a passive form. We don't want to expect, accept how horrible and maiming and harming shunning is. But don't watch Tower put, a true friend shows love at all times. A, this should say a true um, Jehovah Witness shows love at all times when everybody is conforming to the organisation. It's, it's brilliant how they cover it up. Oh no, you know, we'll do... what If you can prove that you've repented, then you're welcome to come back. Um, just sit up the back and when we decide that you're, you've proven that you've repented, then that's okay. No. What they, what, do you know where they've come undone, viewers? They're trying to apply... Christian leadership obligations, if you're a leader, to the poor old normal Christian person that just wants to go to church and learn about God. That's how ignorant most religious people are when they start trying to apply leadership applications to the normal poor old person that just wants to go and worship God. The only obligation they should have is to walk in and walk out. All this other stuff is not of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's man-made religious stuff. As a matter of fact, when the church starts intruding into people's family lives, that's when all the trouble starts. If the church would just keep its place and keep its nose out of people's businesses, business, personal, private business, everyone would be okay. They've taken theology and made it as a lord over people's families and everything else. No. No. So should we move on from this statement and continue to study Article 44? You have this group of people locked in an attic because they're talking about 
the end when the end comes. It's another thing, isn't it? The poor old buggers don't even know what's going on with the end times. Wouldn't have a clue, the Jehovah Witnesses, what's going on with the end times. Now, look, if you get if you get taken out before the tribulation and go to the judgment seat of Christ, you're not going to be punished. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses don't want to be raptured. I don't know what they're going to do. Does anybody know what the Jehovah Witnesses are going to do when the rapture takes place? What are they going to do? Stand there and argue the toss with the Lord that we don't want to go. Because by faith, you're going whether you like it or not. You're going to be flying through the sky. Now, this is one of the proofs that the Lord hasn't come back yet because nobody's disappeared. The, the poor old J-Dubs, they've got the Lord propped up in, a, in an attic. Where's our picture of the attic? Oh, hang on, what have I done? Forgive me, viewers, forgive me. They've got the poor old Lord propped up in an attic somewhere in New York or something of that nature. But just for argument's sake, can I say, there's more than one judgment, viewers. Let's get that clear from the start. There's more than one judgment. There's judgment number one, which was the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross for sin. Jesus paid for sin at the cross. That's judgment number one. Everybody say, that's judgment number one. Judgment number two is when the believers, be it Jehovah Witness, Catholic, whatever, the poor old Jehovah Witnesses are in for a shock, aren't they? When the Lord comes with the sound of a trumpet and all the rest of it and the rapture takes place. And there's people that don't even believe that it will. But it will. And it's going to be a shock, isn't it? When feet start leaving the ground and all the rest of it. And we meet the Lord in the air. That's judgment number two. No one's going to get in trouble at that judgment. By the way, that's the good news for those that don't know. That is the good news of the gospel. Judgment number three is when the Jewish race or the Jewish people, the Israelis, will be judged during the Great Tribulation when all hell is going to break loose on the nation of Israel and the ripple effect will be the goat nations that want to destroy it will fight against the sheep nations which want to try and save it and help it. But unlike the Holocaust, the Allies are not going to be able to stop this attack. And the enemies of Israel will almost annihilate it, with the crescendo being in the Battle of Armageddon. By the way, during this part of the tribulation, the end part, the 144,000 come down for a final gleaning and take out the tribulation and Old Testament saints to be with the church. And then Christ saves Israel and returns with the saints to annihilate the people, which is very unfortunate, but he has to annihilate the nations that are trying to destroy the people of Israel. That's judgment number four. So judgment one, number one is Christ at the cross. Number two, the believers for reward. Number three, the people of Israel in the Battle of Arm, um, the Great the Tribulation, the Great Tribulation, and the consummating in the Battle of Armageddon. Number four, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes down and punishes those who <coughs> were against Israel and um, rules over those who tried to save her. And then judgment number five, which is, People only think that this is the judgment that we're headed for. This is judgment number five, where we go, to, where we don't go, but where all the unbelievers that didn't want to have anything to do with it go to front up before the Lord at the great white throne. We'll be ruling with Christ here in the millennium, and they're going to get in trouble for whatever reason, and they're going down with the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, and Satan himself to the bottomless pit, which is called the second death, because you have one death, and this is also called the second resurrection for the unbelievers, but they'll go to the second death, which is spoken about in the Bible. 
<clears throat> now another problem that the J-dubs have, and it is in Second Peter somewhere, I can't read that, and I'm sure you know, it's also in Revelation 21, the earth will be destroyed by fire. Now, that's, I, I don't know why, in all their business acumen and corporate acumen, the Watchtower couldn't have got this right. Because the poor old J-dubs will be barbecued. But the, the problem that they've got is none of what they're being told is going to happen. They're going to be up here with the church. I don't know how they're going to share or how they're going to accept it, but that's where they're going to be. Now, this is, this is what's going to happen in the end time. Now, whether the church gets taken out before the tribulation or in the middle of the tribulation or before the end of Armageddon, one thing's for sure, the believers are going out. They're going up to meet the Lord in the air. And then after that, the Lord is coming down to save Israel. And that's when the millennial age starts. At the end of the millennial age, Satan finds his doom, takes a few more people with him, probably from the goat nations. The earth gets burnt and there's a new heaven and a new earth, which is where apparently... We're all going to hang out. But I don't know what the Jehovah Witnesses are going to do there either because they don't like to mix with anyone, do they? So there's a lot going on here, isn't there? And we, we haven't even started. Goodness me, we haven't even started the article. I don't want to go into a great big spin on how the end's going to go. They should know. You should know. It's <laughs> The information's there. The poor old Watchtower Bible and track Jehovah Witnesses have been so deceived. According to 1 Peter 4, 7 through 8, what will happen to, what will help us to cope with adversities? <clears throat> now, I just want to say before we go any further, is the Lord Jesus Christ going to get a mention here? Is, is he, is, will he get a mention? Oh, here's the grandson and, and the wife. Look there in the background. Wave. There he is. I'm going to sign off there. But is the Lord Jesus Christ going to get a mention? I don't think so. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist. We'll come back with paragraphs 1 and 2, according to 1 Peter 4, 7 through 8, what will help us to cope with the adversities in the next lesson. But thank you for joining me and bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, 
maybe even comment if you're watching on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one of life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.